Happy Tuesday, everyone. Happy Tuesday. 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 I know that you didn't enjoy the long weekend, maybe because you were missing the campus, but anyhow, you are back. Now, while you were outside, I just left the handout on your desk. It essentially covers lots of many things that we have covered so far, and there are somehow more practices, if you want, for the upcoming test, which is going to be on Thursday, which I'm sure all of you are just going to use it, just get about 90 left. Now, What's going to be the plan for today and tomorrow? The plan is that we are just going to today have some kind of a revision, do some problem solving from the handouts that you have. Unfortunately, I didn't have the stapler. Then please, you kindly just staple it and keep it with yourself in case you want to do some more practices. Now, today, we're just going to randomly do some kind of a focused and targeted practice for the Thursday exams. Then please. If you have today on Tuesday two ears and two eyes, uh, four eyes and four ears, and tomorrow you double it because tomorrow is going to be really more targeted for the test that you're going to have on Thursday. Yes. Sorry. Oh, today you're missing the class. Or oh, no worries. I'm just gonna, and the good thing is that, yes, I'm going to give you back to one. Yes. Oh, no worries, but I just came with a very good solution to that. And the thanks for reminding me of that problem. And the solution which I came with that is that every session that you are here, I'm recording it. And now, you are here. Everyone smile. You are on the camera. You are not on the camera. The board is on the camera. I have to smile. Hello. <laughs> Hope you are not on the camera. I'm recording every session, and I'm just going to post it every session on the Google Classroom. And in case if you want to watch it to review and practice more, you can just go. You are one click away. Just go behind your laptop. You open it. You are one click away from you watch the latest of that day. Then for the people, Tony and Brooke, that they are not here today, they can just go to watch the content uh, later, tonight. Now, let's get started. Uh, any question before we start? Nothing? Is that you are smarter. Okay, let's start. Today, uh, just please go to page, uh, it's going to be on the section exercise 1.5. It's at the lower part of the handouts that you have. It says that it's page number 46. I hope I just mix them in good order. And for if it's that so, let's start and solve this exercise. Okay. Page number 45 and 46. Okay. Yes. Guys, the first example which I'm just going to solve for everything, today and tomorrow, specifically tomorrow, tomorrow is going to be lots of fun. Please come here with the popcorn because you are just going to enjoy tomorrow's session. Today, the thing that we do is this, that I'm just for each topic that you're going to focus, I'm just going to start with something very easy. It's a kind of a warm up, then we start with something which is more focused. Now. I'm just going to start with the concepts of the limit, and when I think of the limit, it reminds me of the Cyrus, because on that session, he was walking either from the left or from the right, and unfortunately, he fell. Sorry, but it always reminds me of that day. It was a very good example to just learn the limit. I hope it wasn't that painful when he fell, because there was no continuity there. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to start by page number 45, exercise number 4, which says that evaluate each limit. I'm just going to go with number A, which is going to be the easy one we are going to start. Then after this, that if you have this kind of review, we move on to something more rigorous. And please do not forget, stay here with me tomorrow. It's a very important day for the when it says that, we are just going to find the limit 
We do not want to engage ourselves now with the philosophy of what was the limit in the case that the Sanyasan had to walk from left and walk from the right. We are not going to deal with that. The only thing that we are just going to focus today, it was this concept. And uh, it was this concept. We said that whenever you have a function, for example, I'm just going to put this as a kind of a side note. We said that whenever we have a function f of x, we are interested to find its behavior. We normally use the limit. For example, we said that we are pushing x, our variable, as close as possible to a certain value of our interest, which I call that, for example, it's going to be a. We saw that in most of the cases that we do not have irregularities, like the case that the scientists had to walk from left and also from the right. We said that. What do we do? We lean back, take a deep breath, close our eyes, and we do a direct substitution, which means that we put A inside X, and the direct substitution gives the value of the limit. If that's so, we are looking into this limit. We are looking into this limit by following this very basic principle of analyzing, I call it psychoanalysis of the function, because we find that there are so many functions that behave crazy. If that's the case, for this limit, I say, okay, I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to write it here. I'm going to say, okay, I'm just going to close my eyes, take a deep breath, substitute to inside the x. Then it becomes three times two over two to the power of two plus two. How much do I get? I get six on the roof. I'm in the numerator and I have four plus two becomes how much? Six. Then if you bother to simplify that further, you get plus one. As easy as that. You see, finding the limit is is a little bit boring these days. You just close your eyes and you just jump in, you stop it, you get the result. Any questions on this? No? Now, if you have no questions, we are going to look. Yes, yeah, we are. Are we going to have to do a change of value method or no? Everything, it may be. But Shumar, please be stay here. We get more focused on that question. Now, if that's the case, I'm going to just do deal with some kind of different function. Functions that we saw, they are not going to behave normal and they are just going to behave crazy. And I'm just going to just deal with the other functions which I have. I'm just going to write this as the limit. Let's see how much space we want to I'm going to write this one here. I say that what is going to be the limit? Today I have some problems to find the market. We said that what is the limit of this function? I'm just going to the next page of the handouts that you have. I'm just going to pick up one which is going to be, let's say, hmm. okay. I'm just going to pick up, for example, uh, this one. I'm going to take this function. Equation, equation number 9, part D, square root of x plus 1 minus 1 over x when x is going to 0. Okay, when it comes to this function, we said that, okay, we know that we have to move back to a direct substitution. That's what we're going to start this part. And I put the direct substitution. I put 0 wherever I see x, then it becomes how much? It becomes square root of 0 plus 1 becomes 1. 1 minus 1 becomes how much? 0. Then I have 0 over what? 0. And we saw that in calculus, wherever you see something like this comes up, you have to scream and run away because 0 over 0, that's something that it is a disaster. Then you see that for these type of functions, you cannot just do a direct substitution. You have to just come with some kind of strategy. And if you remember, one of those strategies that we taught, we said that 
We are just going to write the limit as it is. <clears throat> to save that, we are going to write the limit. I'm just going to write the exact function. Square root of x plus 1 minus 1 over x. But also, we know that the x is going to 0. What do you think is going to be the best? Yes. I'm going to wash it. Yes, please. No problem. What do you think is going to be the best? Yes, Gabriel. Yes. Fantastic. You just read my mind very quickly. Thank you. I just wanted to ask, what is the best strategy? And Gabriel said that we have to use the conjugate to solve this one. Why do you need to use the conjugates? Everyone, please look at this. Because normally in the math, when you see these kind of square roots, they are a little painful to work with them. You see, you want to see what is the content inside. You have to break that square root off. It's not an easy one. Then always we try to resolve it by removing this, I should say, the squared one. The best strategy to do so was this one. I'm just going to write this identity here. If you remember, guys, we said that. We talked about what identity from functions 11, which I love it very much. And we said that this is a conjugate identity, which means that a plus b multiplied to a minus b, it's what? a squared minus b squared. We said that that's the conjugate identity of two items, of two terms that they are multiplied, and they are the conjugate. Why do you call them conjugate? Because look at this. Plus is minus there, or minus is plus there. That's the conjugate part. Now, if you look at this, the beauty, guys, of this, co com this conjugate identity is this, that when you have something, Look at this. For example, you start by a plus b. You product it with a minus b. It's conjugate. You see that you have it squared. And it reminds you of the fact that imagine a or b, they are square roots like this. Then when you just take and raise them to the power 2, you can get rid of that square root on top of it. Then it becomes my uh, intuition to multiply this to its conjugate. Its conjugate is what? x plus 1, square root of x plus 1. However, yes. Somebody said something. That's right. It has to be multiplied to its conjugate. If it's minus 1 there, it has to be plus there. At the same time, we remember that the term that I'm multiplying that in orange color, it has to be equal to 1. Because if you have, for example, $5, you multiply to 1, still you are not richer or you are not poorer, you still have $5. And that's the thing, I have to multiply to this 1 to not change its value. Square root of x plus 1 plus 1. And now, you see that whatever I have written in orange, it's one, it's nothing that it's just gonna just you know bother us. But the beauty is this, I'm just gonna write it here because I do not have much space there. Okay, look at these two terms. These two terms are conjugate to each other. Then as a result, I do what? I get I use this identity. The first term raised to the power two becomes how much? x plus 1 minus the second term raised to the power 2. What is the second term? That's right. Minus 1 over x times this. Square root of x plus 1 plus 1. Still, I do not forget that I'm just evaluating the limit. We have solved a couple of these items in the past. I hope still you have your notes, your handout. You still have those ones. These are just the review of these psychotic functions. I call them crazy functions. 
Now, look at this. Now, you get the second step of the limit. What you need to do, should you still close your eyes and put such a zero over there? No, because you see that that's right. Because you see that that one, wait a minute. I have plus one, minus one in there. How much is that? Zero. I have x here and I have x at the basement. I can just cancel them out. That's right. Then it means that the thing which I do is that still I carry the limit operator. How much do I have at the numerator after these equations when I cancel x? 1 and minus 1 becomes 0. Then x over x, I have 1 left over there. Then I left with whatever I have inside. Square root of x plus 1 plus 1. Which I know still that the x should go to 0. Now, my friends, I'm going to ask everyone what is going to be the task now. Yes. Do we close our eyes? That's right. <laughs> I like the answer. You close your eyes, take a deep breath, lean back, and direct substitute there. If that's going to happen, what do you get? It equals to, you have one at the roof, you put zero inside the square root. Becomes zero plus one. How much is that? One. Square root of one, how much do you get? One. One plus one, how much do you get? Two. Two. That's right. And, my friends, you are done. Then you were able to do some kind of a psychoanalysis on this crazy function which odds strangely at point zero. It odds strangely because if you put zero, you get that crazy zero over zero. But you use the conjugate method to reduce it to 1 over 2, or to resolve it to 1 over 2. Yes, Gabriel? Uh, That's right. Awesome. Guys, it's yes. Tell me. That's right, because this one, 0 0.099, it's closest to 0 0.5, and 0 0.5, that's right, it's 1 over 2. Yeah, yeah it's also correct, because at this approximation, it can be 0 0.5, yeah. and that's correct. I'm so glad that you used the calculator also, you can double check it. Mm -hmm. That's good, that's a good strategy, to double check at the end, if you got the same thing, maybe I was wrong, you know? Sometimes I do something very quick, then I get it at the end, but that's a good way to check it. Thank you, Tony. And now, guys, any questions on this? Everyone's feeling happy? Yes? Now, okay, let's see. From here, we move on to the other parts. And I think that's a good thing that if we just move on to discuss something about, and also please feel free to do the rest of the other exercises if you feel that you need to do, because it's more practice. And tomorrow when you see, you can just uh, raise that with me if you just want into any problems. But I think that was a very good thing that we did it today in terms of, I should say, the evaluations of the limits. And now, okay, let me, uh, let me do that tomorrow. I just uh, use one more type of these ones tomorrow, but I can't go today because you have one over, it's good enough to just review that concept now. Please now go to page number 73. Now, 
respect to the race is. Anyone has a question about the limits, the methods to find the limits? I recommend you check your notes that we covered on that day. We also covered four different strategies. Of course, one of those four, that's the conjugate method. Please number 74. Okay, exercise number 11. You are just going to do number 11. What does number 11 say? Part 11 says that determine the equation of a line that is tangent to the graph. I know that the functions which are time given, f of x is equal to square root of x plus 1, which we say that. It's parallel to this line. We are looking for the tangent to this one, which is also parallel to x minus, let me write this one here, parallel to x minus 6y plus 4 equal to 0. Okay, this one is essentially a good motivation that you reduce some of the core concepts of the derivatives that we talked before. We said that, if you remember from, from uh, the week ago that we discussed, we said that we had two different approaches because we said that all the calculus that we talk about, we are always engaging ourselves to find how the things around us change itself. And to do this, we had two different perspectives. The first perspective, derivatives. The first perspective that we have it was analytics. In terms of the analytics, what we did was this. We said that. We said that imagine there is a function. So we have this function as f of x. If we have a function which is f of x, and now we are interested to see how that function changes, then x changes, we use this notation. D of f of x over dx. It means that how f of x changes, then x changes. We said that one. Nice. We said that in order to do this, we are going to use the concepts of the limit. We said that. We simply do this. We said that f of x plus h, we make a very infinitesimal change along the variable minus f of x over h, when h is getting so, so tiny and small, infinitesimally smaller, that was a definition of the derivative or a spontaneous rate of change. They, they two things, they were two sides of the coin. Yes? Now, with this method that we talk, we are just going to use this one to find this, uh, this function here. Let me see if I write here. It's going to be recorded. Yes. Look at this. I'm not yet there to just find. Let me also explain this. The geometrical perspective. The geometric, I should say, interpretation of the same thing that we found. If you remember, and it's a very interesting topic, is that imagine that 
This is what a desirable function was. Look at this. Look at this point. For example, that's the point which I'm just going to project it along the x-axis. It told me that, for example, it's called x naught, And also, it has a projection along the y-axis, which is called alpha x naught, provided that this plot is for function f of x. Now, look at this. The thing that we covered so far was that at this point, we can assess the rate that the function changes if x naught is moving a little bit backwards or forwards. A little bit tiny, I should say, oscillation, for example. And that was the reason that we defined the concepts of the derivative. And if you remember, we said that the value that you get at for d of x over dx, numerically evaluated at point x naught, it essentially gives you what? The slope of a tangent. What is the slope of a tangent? It means that if you have the horizontal line, the angle that you get, if that's going to be the alpha, in the geometric interpretation of the derivatives that we talked over two weeks ago on that, we said that d of, d of x of f of x evaluated at x equal to x naught is essentially is a tangent of this angle there, which is alpha. And that's what we call that. And that was the reason also we said that this tangent line, it can be represented by this y equals ax plus b. That's right. We said that a is the tangent of this line, which as a second interpretation, we said that all the things that we get at the end is essentially the same thing, the slope of the tangent line. Yes, sir. And this is essentially this line at the end. It becomes like the diamond of a kind of a dual wheel of your calculus course, which connects the analytical interpretation of the derivative to its geometric representation. You are reconciling two things, the analytic part to its geometry. Always call this the jewelry, the diamond of your calculus. Now, yes. A. A is essentially the slope of the tangent line. A is this. Because this tangent line, it's a line. Always the line is represented by y equals ax plus b. Then you say, what is A? You get it from the numerically invalidated of the derivative of the functions at point x naught. For the point b, you need one more line, you need one more point. For example, the point that you know x naught and f of x. Any questions so far? A was a review of the things that we did. Now, now I'm just going to focus on this. If I focus on this, I look at this function, I just want to find the equation of Uh, the tangent line, I'm all right. Equation of the tangent line to the graph had a lot to this. Maybe this question is a little bit easy, but since a little bit it's too easy, maybe we do not need to just incorporate all of this stuff. I'm just going to solve it the easy part first before we just move on to just find the derivatives. Look at this. If you have in for example, if you have a Cartesian plane, this represents the y-axis, this represents the x-axis, and that's the origin. And somebody gives you two lines. For example, look at this. This is the first one. The first is straight line. We said that this equation is y equals to ax 
plus b. Yes? And also, I just give you another line. And I say that, okay, another line is this y equals to a prime x plus b prime. Based on the things that you learned over here, a is the derivative of that uh, function evaluated at the point that you are measuring. And that function is this. However, before we just go this one, if I say these two lines, the red one and the green one, they are parallel. What does it mean? Yes. Anyone? So everyone say it by yourself. That's right. This looks. So I just wanted to be fair, not to point to anyone. I said everyone yell it. Yell it at me. To be fair, that everyone answers. Now, it means that if these two lines are parallel, it means that A prime should equal to A. Now, look at this. The slope of the tangent to this one is parallel to this one. Then it means that if I come here and simply find the slope, I can say, okay, I know almost what happened there. I'm just going to rewrite this. I say, okay, I write 6y equals to x plus 4. From here, I divide both parts by 6. Then y equals to what? 1 over 6. x plus 2 over 3. So far, so good. I didn't do anything. I just simply rearranged the terms there. I took 6x to the other side. x plus 4 remains there. I divide both sides by 6 because I was looking for a standard format of the equation of the straight line. By doing this, what is the slope of this line? 1 over 6. It means that if the tangents to this graph is parallel to this, it has to be 1 over 6. That's right. Now, let me erase this part. Any questions so far? When we are done with this, we just take a quick break. Then we continue with two other important things. Okay, how much time do we have? Oh, very much. Okay, now, look at this. So far, if I just want to write the tangent line to this function parallel to this, then I have to find two things. Ax plus one. The tangent line equation to this function parallel to this, it comes with this one. We know this. The question is that, how much is the A? I figured this out. Because this tangent to this function is parallel to this line, it means that there is slope. The coefficients of the A should be equal. Then it means that, first of all, the tangent line should have the slope of 1 over 6. So far, so good, huh? That's right. However, what is going to be the value of the B? How to find the value of the B? Any guess? Yes. Can you take a point that's on the um, that's on the line and plug it in? The x value and that's on the B. That should be this is on the line? It's not on the line. Or this one. So that one. Take the first function and then you plug in an x value and find the y. And if you find the y. That's almost, you're almost there. Thank you. Any other idea? Yes. Um, in this case, we have to find the derivative of root of x plus 1. And we have to, and we have to figure out um, exactly when does x, what, what is x equal uh -huh. so that it's going to be 1 over 6. Um, and then you plug in 
and once you find it, what actually stores in the flow gate goes on your script, then you can put that into the original function to get what the y equals, when x equals that specific number, mm -hmm. and then you put that into the line to find the answer. That's a brilliant strategy. Thank you. Yes, uh, yes. Yes, please. Please do so. Yes. That's right. You're almost. You're almost there. I like all the. That's right. That's brilliant. All the answers are correct in some way, but guys, look at this. This part is a little bit tricky, and this question seems it's a kind of I should say, uh, not an easy one because at this part you get a little bit of stuff. How should I find the value of the intercept B? The value of the slope. It's easy to find because based on the things which I know, it's this formula. And if two lines are parallel, it means that they have the same square. However, look at this one. In order to find, let me go right here and check these concepts of the normals and the parallel ones because you may have this something similar on the test. Look at this one. If you have a function f of x and you have the tangent of the, the, the tangent line, which we call that, it comes with the equation y equals ax plus b. The value of the a that you get is the numerical derivative of this function at the point x naught. Then it means that if you have, for example, we get the derivative at this point, 1 over 6, it means that it comes as a numerical value of the derivative of this function. Then in order to find what point gave you the slope of 1 over 6, and then you find it, you can also get the b, because at, at least you have one point belonging to this graph. Then in order to do so, I say, okay, we should not be deluded. We got the slope because it was parallel, but at the same time, we have to find the derivative to see what point gives this numerical value of 1 over 6. Then as a result, I'm just going to do this d of p of x of f of x, which is d over dx of this function, square root of x plus 1. And now that's the thing that you have to find out. I give you one minute. You try to give it a try. Just find the derivative of this function. Two minutes. To find the derivative, then we do this on the board. And it also allows me not to talk constantly. And I'll let you know what's the word. So that they look at how much. But thank you very much for the people who just shared the ideas. Your ideas was wonderful. Thank you guys. Thanks everyone. You are there? Great start. Thank you. Okay, guys, let's let's do this, then we take the break. What kind of three events today? I never learned, still, I haven't learned this.
I'm so glad that you're honest and tell me the right answer. Otherwise, I let you go even earlier than the break. Tell me 10 minutes. I say, okay, bye guys, after 10 minutes. Okay, in order to find the derivatives, I normally tell you also there is one step that you can always sit back, take a deep breath, close your eyes, but take the derivative. And that always comes by using this very interesting identity. We covered, and that's a good thing, at this part, we review some of the basic things that come. We said that the derivative of a function a x to the power n, this one it's very easy to find it. You have the exponent, it falls, becomes n, a you keep the coefficients, and you have the x, but the power is n minus 1. We subtract 1 from it. Now, we also, as an extension to this, we said that, then as a result, we learned that the derivative of any constant number becomes how much? Zero. Zero. Thank you. And also, we said that, I'm just going to write this in black because this is a very important one. We said that d over dx of any function which is raised to the power n, it becomes what? Somehow similar to this. We said that we have a, we have the function f of x, which its power is reduced by 1. Let me see, let me use another favorite color of mine. That, that's the only one. Then you multiply all these ones into these terms, d over dx of f of x. These other things which are not these identities very much, they are going to be useful along your way. Now, if I'm just going to use this one to solve this derivative, the thing which I do, first of all, based on the things which I have learned, I know that. You can see this if I write here at the far back. You know that if you have, for example, any expression to the power n n is essentially this. It becomes this one. Then as a result, if you have a square root, for example, you have a to the power of 1 over 2, it becomes the square root of the a. These things, it's for you have learned it years ago, many years ago. Now, if that's the case, in order to find this derivative, I'm going to do this. I say then it becomes d over dx. And I know that x plus 1 should go to the power 1 over 2. If that's the case, you, you, you wonder, what have I done? I said, no worries, guys. Look at this identity. That's where it comes from. You change the square root into the exponent form. Now, you wonder, you just want to find the derivative, but you see, okay, this identity is more relevant because 1 over 2 is not just for the x, it is for a function, and that function is x plus 1. Then what do you do? You say, okay, first of all, I take the exponent, multiply this. My exponent is how much? 1 over 2. Then you have the function itself, then you subtract 1 from it. It becomes x plus 1. 1, more, 1 over 2 minus 1. How much do you get? That's right. Minus 1 over 2. Multiply it to the derivative of f of x. 
Let me write this again in case you you got you don't get confused. D of D of X of the function itself, the pure function, the function which does not have the exponents, the pure one. Let me write it. Becomes one over two. I have x plus one minus one over two. I now look at this. When you want to take the derivative for this one, you know that you have to break the operator term by term. The derivative of x, how much is that? One. Derivative of zero, how much is that? derivative of one? How much is that? Zero. Then this one gives you what? 1 d over dx of x plus 1, it gives you only 1. If you use this identity successively on each term, then as a result, you get what? The derivative is going to be this value. You may be curious. You say, ah, I have minus 1 over 2. Uh, you say, ah, I don't like the minus, for example, it's on the top. What should I do with this? I say, my friends, no worries. When you have anything to the power which is negative, you can simplify it by taking all terms into the basement. And if that's the case, I say, okay, the minus exponent, it becomes like this, it becomes 1 over 2, x plus 1 to the power of 1 over 2. And you still say that, I just want to write this one like this. 2 square root of x plus 1. And that becomes anywhere along the baseline. If you stop here, it's fine. If you decided to continue this further to get to this, it's there. Yes, please. Sorry, it's maybe it's two lost values. Why is the red one? The red one becomes 1? Yeah. Look at this one. Yeah. You have to expand this one goes inside. Successively use this identity, Tony. Look at this. D of dx of x, how much is that? If this is x, look at this. D of dx of x. The exponent is 1. 1 times 1 becomes 1. x, 1 minus 1 becomes 0 x to the power 0, anything, omit resonia to the power 0, how about I'm going to get? 1. 1. If you see me with the power 0, I'm 1. Then you can see, okay, for x is a slice of place, it becomes 1. <laughs> omit resonia to the power 0, it's 1. Don't say that to the other students in the class. They just, they come to me, say, oh, that teacher is talking crazy. <laughs> Let's keep these crazy things inside this class. Let's keep these inside the class. <laughs> okay. Now, Tony, does it make sense now? Super. No worries. Now, guys, we are almost one minute away. Any questions for this part? Nothing? If no, if any one of your quizzes to question tomorrow, only then at the power zero, how much is that? It's maybe one of the questions. Yes. The red part is not equal to zero. It's the orange part that's equal to zero, right? The orange part. Which orange part? The orange part of it is equal to one. This one? This one becomes one plus zero. Right. Becomes one. One times to all things becomes that thing itself. Look at this one. This one is multiplied. Correct? Right. D of dx of x plus 1, how much do you get? About 0. 1. Plus 1, I mean, yeah, yeah. 1. Then this time, this expression multiplied to 1 becomes itself. Omid resonium into the 1 becomes omid resonium. Right. Then this one gets it by itself. Mm -hmm. Then from here, you simplify that by taking it down and change it to the square root. I, I get that. Awesome. Yeah. So glad. Any other questions, guys? Everyone is fine? Sebastian, you're fine? Yeah, yeah, we're good. Awesome. And now, guys, we are only one minute away to solve this problem. And that's the thing. We got for 
the change in mind to this function. I say, come to you, okay, my friends. The change in mind, you say, oh, you are mean, you mean y equals x plus b? As, as simple as that. The a, it was 1 over 6 because it was parallel to this. But at the same time, based on the analytic interpretation of the derivative, we know that the derivative evaluated at the point of interest gives you the slope. Then if I have 1 over 6 over here, because I know it's parallel to this, then 1 over 6 necessarily means that it has to be this. Let me... Let me, I have to erase some. Let me, is it okay if I erase this part? Uh, now, I know that now that this trend of evaluated at the point that I'm looking for, it gives me this look. It means that 1 over 2 square root of x plus 1 evaluated at the point of my interest. Imagine that this is going to be my f of x. This is the tangent at that point. Yes? Now, it has to be what? 1 over 6. This is going to be essentially a very important part. This one, evaluated at the point on the graph, it gives you the slope. Look at this one. That's why I told you this line is the jewelry of the rest of the calculus that you're going to learn. Just simply this one. The derivative of a function evaluated at the point of interest is not, it equals you the slope of a tangent line. The slope of a tangent line was 1 over 6. Then it means that 1 over 6, this is a over there, evaluated at the derivative of the function. Derivative of the function is this. Evaluated at the point, I call it still x. Now the question is that. How much is the x? Because if I know how much is the x, I can find one point on the tangent line to find its b. Does it make sense to everyone? Yes? Yes, sir. Because as I mentioned, that's right. It's not the equation to the line. Sorry, what? It's not the equation to the line. It's the equation to the point. There's something wrong with my equation. No, just for the slope. The that thing that we got, we got there, it's just the derivative for the square root of x plus one. It's Not just a derivative. Is it, is it a derivative of slope or a line? It's a slope. Slope. The, slope the, the derivative of the function, tell me, the derivative of the function gives you the slope, huh? And because because we know how much is the slope. We call it, okay, this one goes to 1 over 6. And the question that we are facing now, how much is the x? 8. How much? 8. Let's see. In order to solve it, I take both sides, go to the power 2. Because I'm just going to get you up the square root. How much time do I have? 20 minutes? 12 minutes. 12 minutes, okay. The time management wasn't that bad today. I take both sides to the power 2 because I need to get rid of that square root. It means that then it becomes 1, 2, the square root of x plus 1 to the power 2 equals 1 over 36. Are you okay? You can see this from that one? Yes? Because I think both sides to the power 2. If you make the denominator equal to the Everyone is fine then? Yeah. Yes? Do not get confused? Yeah. If that's the case, yeah. I'm just going to do this. 
because they have right. equal, two things are equal, the numerators are equal, I'm going to write it, write it right away. If you got confused, let me know that. Then I say, because the numerators are equal, because I have two ratios that they are equal, the numerators are equal, it means that the base should be equal. Then it means that two times square root of x plus 1 should equal to 6. Everyone is okay so far? Why is that? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, how to solve it? I think both sides go to the power 2. This to the power 2 becomes 4 x plus 1 equals to 36. From here, you get x plus 1. You divide both sides by 4. You get 9. Then x should equal to x. I give you one minute to write. And it's a kind of a reason also you get some rest in case if you just want to write. Unless it's so beautiful. You see that? Crazy about this. No. We still don't have the answer. Can you just do one answer? Like, just the derivative and then solve that right there. And that's what we do. Yeah. That's what we did exactly on that time. Yeah. We found the derivative because the derivative to give you the thing, the slope of the line, then the equality is one over six. Okay. So we could have just done one over six is equal to uh, Oh wait, no we could one, one over two. Oh that's what we did. Oh never mind. That's yeah, right. Yeah, we got the exactly. derivative, the equity to one over six because we know how much is the slope. Okay. Now we only have Less than a minute to complete this. Any questions, guys, so far? So this question was a little bit lengthy, but that is a good practice for for the coming test. Uh, look at the. Uh, let me drive here before I move on. Look at this. This is a function f of x. And this one is a tangent to the line. It comes y equals ax plus b. In this one, we know how much is the a. And we know how much is the x. Can I find how much is the b? Everyone please listen. Can I find it? Yeah. Yes, because guys, Sebastian and uh, and also look at this. Why? Because if I have x naught, then I get f of x naught. Then I have one point which belongs to this line. Then my plan right now, what I'm going to do there is that from the x naught which I got, this is eight. Fine, it's f of x naught by putting x naught into the f of x. Then I have one point belonging to the line. Then by doing that, where should I write it? Let me write this. OK, x is 8. The function is what? f of x. Then it means that f of 8 should be square root of 8 plus 1 becomes the square root of 9, which is 3. Then the point which I'm looking for, it has a coordinate, which is x is 8, y is 3. I know that the a from the thing which you learned is 1 over 6 for a tangent line. I have the equation of the straight line, which I know what is the slope. I know one point belonging to the line, then it's so easy to find a b. 
but something in value there. Yeah, I have y equals to 1 over 6 times x plus b. This point belongs to this line. Its y is going to be 3. 1 over 6 times 8 plus b. Now, my friends, we are. We have b equal to how much? 3 minus 4 over 3 becomes 9, 5 over 3. Then this is the value of the value. Then you ask yourself then, as a final answer, you get the equation like that. Y equals to 1 over 6x plus 5 over 3. Such a beautiful question we saw. Oh, no. oh, what was that? <laughs> it's not a trend. Take a lot of time. Yes, Sebastian. No, I just stretched. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I forgot to give you some time for stretching today. Oh, but you know what is after the test, when you are good, you can just go for one day stretching. Yes. Yeah.